the Climate Summit in Copenhagen. More than 190 countries gathered here last December to save the world's climate. But the result was a meager compromise agreement without any concrete emission reduction goals. Exclusively obtained audio recordings now reveal how state leaders negotiated behind the scenes and how the summit ultimately failed. It's Friday afternoon, December the 18th, 2009. The 25 most important leaders in the world have gathered, not in the main conference hall, but in the smaller room reserved for negotiations. Over snacks and mineral water, the leaders are discussing a draft of the climate agreement. German Chancellor Angela Merkel tries to get things going. Danish Prime Minister Lars Locke Rasmussen, chairman of the climate talks, opened the talks. The government leaders already have copies of a draft climate agreement. But in the two most important places, an X and a Y have been left as placeholders. There are no concrete figures for CO2 reductions by 2020 and 2050. Merkel takes the initiative. But here, Fai, then China's top climate negotiator, tries to stall for time. Then the Indian representative takes the floor. The Europeans are calling for concrete figures on CO2 reductions. But India isn't prepared to agree. The figures should be hammered out in smaller groups and left for discussion at the next conference in Mexico. We have all along been saying don't prejudge outcomes. Why are we prejudging outcomes? So I would like to say that as far as India is concerned, it is presenting the results of its work in appropriate form for consideration at the conference of parties at its 16th session. Now it becomes clear that India had met behind closed doors in the morning with China, Brazil and South Africa. They agreed to oppose concrete emission reduction goals by 2020 and 2050. China makes that clear once again. The Europeans now begin to realize that they are fighting a lost cause. Still, they refuse to give up. Gordon Brown takes the floor. I, I think it's important to recognize what we are trying to do here. We are trying to cut uh, emissions uh, by 2020 and by 2050. And that is the only way we can justify being here. It is the only way we can justify the public money that is to be spent to do so. It's the only way we can justify the search for a treaty. I think it's very important to recognize that we have to have objectives for 2020 and 2050. German Chancellor Angela Merkel supports her British colleague and suggests a compromise. We could also say that we need a 50% reduction uh, with respect to 2050 and a 25 to 40% reduction with respect to 2020. Then you have to take some burden and we have to take some burden. And then we have uh, all our sins and our things what we are doing. So, Though Chinese negotiator He Yafai remains polite, he does not mince words. Thank you for all the suggestions. You said very clearly, you must support your 50%. French President Nicolas Sarkozy has had enough. Speaking in his native tongue, he rails against China's blocking tactics. 
c'est absolument Ce n'est pas l'esprit de négociation. Ça veut dire que les pays les plus pauvres n'auront pas les moyens que les pays les plus riches sont prêts à mettre sur la table. Pour la seule raison que vous ne voulez pas assumer un engagement à sa à quoi cela sert-il de vous contribuer à parler de cette situation si nous ne sommes pas d'accord là-dessus C'est un moyen essentiel. Arrêtons l'hypocrisie. Now, US President Barack Obama joins the discussion. He wants to make it clear to the Chinese that, if they refuse to act, citizens in the world's industrialized nations will be unwilling to make sacrifices to protect the environment. There is a direct correlation between these issues of concrete targets and commitments and the financing. You can't separate one from the other. We can't get the financing in the absence of something that tells our people that we are not in this alone. Still, Obama also makes it clear that time is growing short. We tried to move on and get these other issues resolved. And I'm saying that confident that I think China still is desirous of an agreement, as we are. Uh, and the alternative right now would be a breakdown of talks that I think would be very counterproductive because, Nicola, we're not staying until tomorrow. I'm just letting you know. Because all of us, uh, obviously, have extraordinarily important other business to attend to. But Higafai refuses to be pressured. On the contrary, he throws the blame for delays back on the industrialized nations. I heard President Sarkozy talk about hypocrisy. I think I'm trying to avoid such words. I'm trying to go into that and debate about historical responsibility. People tend to forget where it is from. In the past 200 years of industrialization, developing countries contributed more than 80% of emission. Who, whoever creates this problem is responsible for the catastrophe we are facing. The negotiations appear to have reached an impasse. Talks continue, but no one in either camp is willing to make concessions. Finally, the Chinese negotiator calls for a break in the talks. I have a procedural request. I kindly ask for a suspension of a few minutes of the consultation. We need some time for the consultation. Thank you. So we will suspend the meeting. But the meeting did not reconvene. Instead, China, India, Brazil and South Africa secretly met in another room to talk. When President Obama arrives, they reach an agreement without the Europeans. The summit comes to an end, without concrete emissions reduction goals. The compromise leaves climate experts disappointed. The Copenhagen summit has been a chaotic failure. Now, the world must wait for the next summit in Mexico and hope that, when world leaders convene in Cancun in November, it won't be about blockades, competing camps and empty words, but rather about our planet.